Hey guys, my name is Radic. I'm the TA for Microeconomics 1B03, and this chapter, chapter 2, still pertains to Economics 1B3, Macroeconomics, and in fact, um, the chapters are the same for 1, 2, 3, and 4 in both textbooks, so if you're in Economics 1B3, you can still watch this. Alright, so chapter 2 is a rather short chapter, so this is going to be a rather short video. So the first thing that we touch upon is economic models. So what is an economic model? A model is a theoretical construct that represents the economic process by a set of variables and a set of logical or quantitative relationships between them. The economic model is a simplified framework designed to illustrate complex processes. So that's a lot of jibber jabber right now, but basically what an economic model is is a simplification of the real world. Now when we simplify uh, our models, we leave out a lot of variables that don't pertain to it. So one of the first models that you will come across in your textbook is basically the, the diagram with firms, households, and the two markets in which they trade in. Now this model isn't really a model that you need, that you will need in, um, in economics all throughout, but it's something that you may be tested on and, and something that I suggest that you know the, the flows, the arrows in between it and what the households and firms represent. Now, I'm going to tell you what the firms and households represent. So the households buy goods and services from the firms, and the households sell their factors of production to the firms. Now, remember we talked about factors of production, land, labor, and capital. Now, the households sell labor to the firms. They, like, you sell your free time to a firm, and they give you money in return. So what do the firms do? The firms produce goods and services and employ factors of production from the households. Simple enough. Now there's going to be a market for, uh, for where these factors of production and, and goods and services are exchanged. So basically all you need to know is just kind of memorize that circular flow diagram. Now we come across to the uh, production possibilities frontier. Now this is a graph that compares the production rates of two commodities that share the same factors of production. The PPF curve shows the specified production level of one commodity that results given the production level of another. Um, it assumes that the maximum possible efficient use of resources for a maximum possible production of both commodities. So now I've drawn this lovely little PPF and it's comparing the, the production between wine and beer. Now when we look at point B, this is an inefficient point. When we look at point C, this is an unobtainable point. And when we look at point A, this is one of the efficient points. Now A is not the only efficient point. Any point on the PPF, on the curve, is efficient. We are maximizing the use of the, of the uh, of land, labor, and capital. Now when we're inside, we have people that are unemployed, land that's being not used, or let's say equipment that's not being rented and used for the production of wine or beer. Now point C is a point that may be obtainable at one point, but it is not obtainable now. Why is it not obtainable? It could be for a number of reasons. We may, like this, this could be a combination of wine and beer where we have a thousand bottles of wine being made and a thousand bottles of beer being made in a single day. Now this may not be possible because we may not have enough people to make that amount. We may not have enough capital to produce that much beer and wine, or we may not have enough land, let's say, to be growing the grapes or the hops. So that's that. And now, this also represents kind of an opportunity cost. So if we're producing here, we're producing completely wine, or if we're producing here, we're producing completely beer. Now, as we see, as we go along, we see the slope changing. Now what does that mean? If we go from point A to this unmarked point here, the opportunity cost change. So for every one bottle of wine that we're giving up here, we're gaining a lot of beer. And as we move along, we have to give up more and more wine to get less and less beer. And that will be explained to you in more detail in class. Now, one of the other things that I want to point out about the production possibilities frontier is changes in input costs. So say, hypothetically, that we have a really good growing season, or a new pesticide is introduced, or let's say even just a new technology about a better process 
about producing wine. It's more efficient. So what happens to the PPF? It will actually almost kind of pivot. And I'll show you this pivot on, uh, on the diagram here. So as you can see, our new PPF has shifted out, but it's only shifted out with wine because none, none of the technology is pertaining beer. So now our curve shifted up this way, so now we can produce more wine without giving up any beer. Now say hypothetically that a new technology comes out and we can produce more beer and wine. So the entire PPF will shift out in that case and we see that by the new PPF here it entirely shifts out. So that's my little blurb on the PPF. So now we go to positive and normative statements. So a positive statement concerns what is, was, or will be and contains no indication of approval or disapproval about what should be. Positive statements are testable or at least it is possible to imagine the fact uh, that we can disprove them. So what about a normative statement? A normative statement expresses a value judgment about whether a situation is subjectively desirable or undesirable. The world would be a better place if rational people didn't shop for oranges rationally. Or let's say the world would be a worse place if Obama wasn't in, in, uh, in office. They are all subject to judgment. Um, so they express judgment about what ought to be, right? It would be a nicer day if it was 32 degrees. Canada would be a better place if it was warm all year round. These are all subjective. These are not my opinions. These are just examples. So that's kind of the spiel about normative and positive statements. Now, as I said, this is kind of a short chapter. The video was kind of short, but I promise you that the upcoming videos are going to be much longer and much more involved. So my name is Radic. I'm your TA, and I hope this video has been helpful. Thanks.